and we're going to move to uh, unsupervised learning. So we don't have time in this course to go through every unsupervised learning algorithm in depth. So the primary thing you're going to learn about, not so much in this lecture, but in the lab class, is latent variable models. But what I thought I'd do in the lecture is um, just give you a sense of unsupervised learning, if, for those of you who haven't seen it before. Some of this stuff, if you've done courses on this before, you should have seen before. So last time, I mean, it's convenient for me to go to unsupervised learning because last time you looked at Bayesian regression and it turns out there's quite a lot of similarities between the way we derive latent variable models and the way we do Bayesian regression. And that's because we did it by a process of introducing priors and uh, computing marginal likelihoods. Um, and we're going to use the same techniques, although I'll only do them in the lab. Uh, well, I'll briefly overview them here for doing unsupervised learning. So. So in supervised learning, uh, normally we think of the situation where we've got some data and it's got a label. And what we're typically trying to do is reconstruct the label. And we'll see in next lecture that label could be a classification, the class of an object. Um, but what we've been looking at so far is that label is a real numbered value, a regression output. Um, now, in unsupervised learning, this is the domain where you effectively have no labels for the data. You just want to learn about the data in some general way. Um, and one way we can think about that is it's a process of perhaps structure discovery. So finding features in the data, um, and sometimes in stats in particular, this is known as uh, exploratory data analysis. So trying to play with and visualize your data in such a way that you start to understand something about your data set before processing it. Unsupervised learning techniques. So in stats, you wouldn't normally say unsupervised learning, um, but you might talk about these definite, uh, different techniques. So I, so I thought I'd sort of create a, a little example data set. And this data set looks quite complex, doesn't it? So the idea is in unsupervised learning, you may be given a data set like this. This is a two-dimensional data set, but it may be much higher dimensional. I've chosen two dimensions so I can plot it. And all you're given is, say, a Y1 and a Y2. There's no inputs associated with them. Your data is just a matrix of Y. Um, so I don't know. So, so, what structure? Can anyone see some structure in this data? Anyone want to mention what sort of structure they might be able to see? If you're visualizing the data like that, what might you notice? Patches of data that might be yeah, patches of data quite close together. Yeah, absolutely. So we, we see that there's some sort of group of data down here that's quite close together, some group of data here. What about this area here? This one here. No, no, I mean from left to right. Yeah. It's almost, it's almost like a... Like this. It's almost like an oval shape that's... Yeah, this, oh, here, all this sort of thing, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, so there's quite a diffuse, yeah, there's quite a diffuse area of data here within this larger cluster. And then also we see something, some sort of feature here, some... Uh, so these sort of things are things that we might identify and look at in data. And if we don't look at them, we might do something like trying to change the scaling or whatever. or there's a, there's a process known as projection pursuit, which is closely related to some dimensionality reduction methods where you can try and visualize the data. So, so patches of data um, are known as clusters. And this sort of diffuse area here would be um, something that actually would probably approach with dimensionality reduction. So those are the two, broadly speaking, the two techniques we're going to introduce today. Now, this isn't real data. It's data that I generated. Um, can anyone guess how I generated this data? Mm. You haven't seen the model, actually. So I generated this data by something called a, a mixture of Gaussians. So, so this is the mixture of Gaussians. So remember, we did the multivariate Gaussian last time, where we looked at one Gaussian. So in the mixture of Gaussians, we're not going to study this uh, further, but it's an, a known unsupervised learning method that I've actually generated the data from here. Um, I've got 20 or something, I think 20 total different Gaussian distributions, and they each have their own covariance. And the covariances are randomly generated. So some are quite strongly correlated, some are a bit more diffuse. Um, and so that's why you get this clustering effect. This one was very dominantly correlated one direction. 
So that's why you sort of see this straight line here. And this diffuse patch we're seeing here was actually the cumulative sum effect of uh, four clusters that coincidentally happen to be quite diffuse and also quite close together. Um, you would not be able to tell. You're quite right about your comment on there. That, that looks like it, it comes from a single distribution. You wouldn't be able to tell. So it's very, uh, it's very subjective um, when you're looking at sparse data what it actually comes from. But what I like about this type of model is we're not going to fit mixes of Gaussian models in the course. They're interesting models. Um, I don't think they work so well in high dimensions unless you use specific variants of them, which would be like mixtures of principal component analyzers or mixtures of factor analyzers. But what we're going to look at today is, is two. We're going to briefly look at clustering. We're not really going to do much on clustering, which is trying to find these separate clusters in data. And we'll just look at k-means clustering to give you an idea of that. But then for the lab and everything, we're going to move on to latent variable models, which is actually when you've got a sort of structure like this, within one cluster, how things vary around the center is effectively what you're looking at in a latent variable model. OK, so we're not deeply covering clustering, but you should be aware of it. And in clustering, what you do is you try and associate each data point with one of k different discrete groups. So we've got these different discrete groups. You're trying to sort of say for each data point, which group do you belong to? Um, for example, clustering animals into discrete groups. So I say this is quite interesting. You know, are animals really discrete, or are they continuous? There's some, is there some continuum of animals? No, they're discrete. So you say that, I think they're continuous. I just think you don't see examples of the animals that sit between all the animals that exist. <laughs> I mean, when you think about it genetically, it's true. They are discrete. They cluster. But they cluster for certain process reasons. There's actually a genetic continuum. It's not really a continuum. That's even more bizarre, because fundamentally, genes are discrete. But there's so many genes that, that they kind of almost exist on a you know, people exist on the continuum. There's some continuum between us and chimpanzees and whatever. We just don't see those animals. Maybe one day we'll be able to create them. Um, <laughs> uh, so, you know, it, it, but obviously, it's, it, so in some sense, that's a discrete, it's a continuous space, but we're, we're discretizing it. And we discretize it with good reason, because fundamentally, there are different animals. But, you know, some cats are more like dogs than other cats, but they're not dogs, but they can be. So you've got this sort of sense of a continuum as well, just in their characteristics. So mentally, we also have this sense of um, continuousness, a spectrum. We, we love to cluster into different political affiliations, right? So there's um, political parties. I, I think, I, you know, how can anyone actually join a political party and agree with everything that party says? You know, it's impossible. But somehow we take, there's a spectrum of beliefs which some people say left to right, but even that's, that's a dimensionality reduction, right? So if you take all political belief and then we put it down onto one line, and you say you're either on the left or the right, you've just reduced everything down to one dimensional perspective. Yeah, so that's a continuous dimensionality reduction, which we'll come back down to. But then within that space, people then create parties, they say. There's the Labour Party, there's the Conservatives, there's the Liberal Democrats, and they're somewhere on that spectrum. But then you can have things like, I mean, that's not quite accurate, is it? Because then Scottish nationalists. Nationalists are normally right-wing, but Scottish nationalists are somehow left-wing. So this is very confusing. So clearly one dimension is not enough to represent the spectrum of political beliefs. There's other things going on. But we do like to sort of cluster them. We do like to say, well, there's one party. We like people to say, you're on the left or the right of that party. So within that party, there's variation. And same within the animals. We do really seem to like clusters. And actually, with biologists, when you're doing analysis of data, um, a lot of the work I've done with biologists has really changed um, my perspective on clustering, which I kind of thought was a little bit arbitrary, because it's, when you're working with real people with data, they, they want to know about clusters. People in marketing, they cluster people into different personality types. I mean, but we're a continuum, really, but they do like to cluster them. The last bit here is this one sort of point I want to mention that says, uh, which is off the screen, unfortunately, which says there's a subtle difference between something called clustering and vector quantization. So do people know what vector quantization is? So vector quantization is very similar to clustering. And in fact, some people would say they're the same thing. But just, I just want to touch on it briefly. Is that, um, OK. Well, I'll use my story to tell you about this, actually. So actually, when, you know, one of the great advantages of having children is like you can do little experiments on them. I mean, 
within bounds. Um, but one of the things when my son was about, I think he was quite young and he didn't know, he knew how to count or something, but maybe th I started this when he was very young. I read somewhere that you could teach children about infinity. And they said, the way you teach them about infinity is you say, what's the largest number? And they do say a number, they'll come up with a number. And then you say, what about this number? And you say a number one above it. And then you say, well, what I did is that I then said, look, there is no largest number. And um, uh, because uh, whatever number you say, I can say one larger. And my son, you know, I don't know what other people's children are all different. They're on a continuum as well. But my son really did not like this. And uh, he sort of, um, we, we kept trying it and he would refuse to sort of say that the largest number is infinity. But then one day, the coolest thing is he came up to me and he said, Dad, the numbers can't go on forever because if they did, they'd be written all over the sky and everything. And I thought, yeah, that's quite true. So he's sort of saying there can't be infinite numbers because they would be everywhere. Uh, and, so he, and, and so then I realized that, that he's got a physical conception of a number that um, he didn't, uh, he couldn't think of it conceptually. He was about three or four, he was very young. And I said, um, no, it's a concept. And I said, uh, okay, for example, how many times could you go round this circle? And he said, once. And I thought, fair enough. Because <laughs> <laughs> otherwise you're going around it again. But then because I'd drawn a circle and he was quite young, he started drawing shapes. So he was doing this or something. And I said, okay, 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 draw all the rectangles. Draw every single rectangle that exists, I said to him. And he started and he was drawing rectangles um, and he went on you know, drawing these sort of rectangles and he, until he got up to eight. I remember he got up to eight and then he said, I'm done. And I said, is that all the rectangles? Um, and he had one that probably looked a bit like that. He said, is that, I said, is that all the rectangles? And he said, yes, that's all the rectangles. And I said, well, what about, thinking I was very smart, what about this one? And I drew a rectangle like that. And he said, that's one of those. <laughs> so his instinct to vector quantize or cluster rectangles was stronger than my ability to teach him about infinity. I think humans really instinctively, it made me sort of realize that actually, Computers aren't good at that. That is, rectangles are totally a continuum. They exist on a two-dimensional space of uh, width and height, right? They're clearly continuous. But as a child, he actually, he, he, he did work it out later. And the thing he then, which totally freaked me out, he wanted, like, years later, it was great. He, uh, he said to me, um, Dad, look, I know, I know the numbers go on forever because he was sick of me doing it. And, but infinity is like the end of the numbers. And I said, yes, that, that's right. And then he said, and zero is like the beginning. And I started talking about negative. I know, I know, but, but zero is kind of like the beginning of the numbers. I said, yes. And he said, and zero plus zero is zero. And infinity plus infinity is infinity. And no other number plus itself is equal to itself. And I knew zero. I never sort of realized that. He, what he was saying was 2a is equal to a. And I never realized, we all say, oh, solution A is zero. But actually, he was right. A could be infinity, I suppose, conceptually. Anyway, so he did work it out in the end. But the thing about him forcing that onto cluster is related to vector quantization. Because actually, rectangles don't live. They live on a continuous space of width and height. If, if we think of that an infinite place, that represents all the rectangles that we could ever imagine. And me trying to sort of get him to do that, what he was doing was covering the space somehow. Well, he drew eight. But well, let's pretend he drew nine. He was covering the space somehow. That's vector quantization. So he was representing a continuous space with a set of discrete numbers. Why do I think it's not clustering? Because within this space, there's no reason to believe there would be a reduction in density between the different spaces. But these terms, the way I'm using these terms, it would vary person to person. So you would say this to someone else, and they would disagree with my definition of vector quantization. They'd say, no, that's still clustering. Or they might have it the other way around. There's not a sort of general uh, strict um, definition of uh, what's vector quantization, what's clustering. But, but vector quantization, so you can take a continuous space, and you can turn it discrete. One area that this is done is JPEG. So actually, when you look at JPEG compression, you're not looking at all the colors. <laughs> 
there's a quantization step where they convert the colors to some discrete thing. And it's all, it's not even, it's not learned, it's not done by machine learning, it's defined by someone. And I think that's why, so in the old days, when the internet was very slow, you used to see JPEGs would come in a bit at a time and they would look quite blocky. And one of the blocky effects is the quantization of the colors uh, was poor because they're not operating, they don't store like a continuous thing of color. They, just, they store discrete places on the color and they try and map it to what colors we perceive well and what colors we perceive badly. Because JPEG is trying to appeal to us. It's not trying to store images in a lossless way. It's trying to store images in a way that we perceive them. So it's trying to use quantization. I don't think it necessarily does it that well. Um, but that's the sort of, you know, so you can see again, there's this continuum idea, but there's this discrete thing on top of it. So I think of that as vector quantization. If you're just trying to, if you, if you really believe the space is continuous and you're quantizing it for implementation reasons, I tend to think of clustering as the case where you genuinely believe there's some reduction in density, like with the animals, you know, that there's an increase in the number of animals that exist, even if they live on a continuous space originally. Um, so in clustering, what we're trying to do um, is how to allocate a given data point to one of the groups. So we, we've got a certain number of groups. So there's 57 animals in the world. And then we want to say, if we see a new animal and we, we want to work out, or we see a group of animals, we want to work out how they cluster, which, which things are animals and which things aren't. Um, and a harder task is working out the number of groups. We're not going to look at that at, at all, but it's the sort of thing people are interested in. It's quite hard to define a little bit though, when you think about it, which is, I mean, you could do an entire lecture course on clustering. So I'm just trying to give you the overview. But the, the reason I can give you the overview very quickly is there's a beautiful, really simple, very fast algorithm for doing clustering. Uh, it's called k-means clustering. Who's heard of this before? Yeah, so a few have seen this before. So it just give you the sense of it. So it's a simple algorithm for putting things into groups. And what you do is you start off, you have to define k is the number of clusters you're going to use. So you have to start off knowing k, um, and you start off with some cluster centers, which we're going to initialize in some way, um, or an assignment of each uh, point uh, to a cluster. So what I'm going to do algorithmically in the next slide is show you a data set. I'm going to initialize the cluster centers, the k cluster centers, as randomly selected data points. So I'm going to take data points. So basically, I don't know. <laughs> you know, I can't remember what he calls it. Actually, Plato had this idea of uh, the, the object like any chair that was the perfect chair. What does he call that? What's the name for that? There's a name for that in philosophy. So somehow the perfect chair was some platonic concept. Um, and uh, so in some sense, the cluster centers are like the perfect chair or the perfect cat, right? And then we're going to measure distance from other objects to that perfect cat. And then we sort of say, oh, well, if you're close to the perfect cat, you're a cat. If you're close to the perfect dog, you're a dog. Of course, now there's various questions, like how do you measure the distances? How do you define, how do you represent these things? Um, but what we do is we allocate each data point to the nearest cluster center. And then once we've done that, in k-means clustering, we update our perspective of what the perfect cat is. So if we say, you're the perfect human being, and then we look at all other animals and we measure their distance from you in some way, and then their distance from the perfect cat, then once we've allocated people as cats and human beings, the next step is you're no longer going to be the perfect being. We take the average characteristics of everyone in this room. We allocate it to be a perfect human being. and We say that's the new perfect being. And we run the algorithm again, mapping everyone to the closest thing. And until you've sort of, till, till things stop changing their um, allocation. Um, so actually this minimizes this objective function here. This objective function is if y is the data point and mu is the perfect center and there's, j, there's k of these different centers, it's the square distance between these centers and the objects. But this objective function does not have a global minimum. There could be different ways of coming up with a clustering and it won't be unique. So you could run the algorithm multiple times and come up with different clusterings. And that's a characteristic of like clustering algorithms. It's typically they are not global minimums, they are not unique. Um, you will tend to find that there are multiple solutions. That's not true of all of them. Some of them have nice relaxed solutions, um, uh, particularly sort of the spectral clustering techniques that uh, relax the non-convex optimization into a convex optimization. But in typical, this is a non-convex optimization problem. That's what this means. It, it doesn't have unique optima. It means it's non-convex. Um, 
and k-means does not converge to a unique optima. So this is a, so a very simple data set. Oh, I've given it all away. Um, a very simple data set of three clusters um, that we're just going to run this algorithm on. So first of all, all we do is we choose three data points at random as the center of our clusters. So we're starting off by saying, I don't know, this is dog, cat, and human. We choose three data points to represent the perfect dog, cat, and human um, at the beginning. And actually, they came out quite luckily like that. Um, one in each, what we might appear to us to be the clusters. Um, <laughs> and then after one iteration, actually, it converged this time. So I'm going to run it again, because that was a bit boring, wasn't it? So what's happening here is the first thing we did was um, chose randomly a cluster point. It happened in this case that we did choose like a human, a dog, and a cat as the perfect human, the perfect dog, and the perfect cat. So actually, when we do the allocation, the allocation works really well. So the, the point in this space, which is closest in terms to Euclidean distance, to all these points are these. So this one is actually closer to this center than to this center. So although you might look at this and think, that looks like a human. At the moment, the way we've initialized, there's this human-like dog here which is causing this point to be here. And it's got no sort of, it doesn't look at the data reduction here. So conceptually, you might think, oh, well, it, but it's wrong because look at, no, there's nothing in between, so it shouldn't connect. But this algorithm isn't looking at that. It's just looking at the distance. So for that reason, I think it's sometimes poorly named. I think it's more of a vector quantization algorithm than a clustering algorithm. It doesn't care that there's a data uh, a, uh, density reduction. But as I say, you know, that's not a globally accepted thought. But now once we've done that, we're going to set the mean, this point here to be the mean of all the blue, this point to be the mean of the red, this point to be the mean of the greens. What's going to happen when we do that? Where's this, where's this point going to move? Down here, yeah, precisely. And then what's going to happen to this point? It'll get reallocated. And then this point actually won't move initially so much because it's well, it will move, actually, even though this point's away here, it'll still move. And then the allocation will be correct. Um, so that's exactly what happens. And then when we reallocate, that blue point turns green. So we don't need the rest of the algorithms. Let's see if we run it again. If I, um, if I come out and in again, I'm going to run it again and see what, if we get a different result. I mean, we should get the same clustering in the end, but oh yeah, that's cool, isn't it? So in this case, um, it's actually chosen. A, it hasn't chosen an ideal human. It's chosen two dogs um, and a cat. Um, so when you do the allocation, you see that this sort of thing here, these are all blue and these are all green. But now, when we set it to the mean you start getting this convergence of the algorithm that they start moving apart from each other. There's some sort of symmetry breaking effect and then until eventually the allocations aren't moving so we've converged. Okay, any questions about that? What might we see is wrong with that algorithm? What about the shape of these clusters? Yeah, so a ball type shape. So if you had two clusters yeah. Yeah. So lots of you can imagine many different types of clustering structure where this would just totally mess things up. So you could imagine like like humans somehow form a circle around dogs. This algorithm would be totally stuffed. You could imagine all sorts of things. The data we saw before, where there was some diffuse and some straight and some that that wouldn't work very well. But it's simple and it's quick. Um, clustering is quite hard to do in general. You could definitely spend an entire career on clustering, um, which I haven't done. <laughs> um, so there's some other, lots of clustering approaches, a bit more complicated. Spectral clustering, very popular, like about, depressing how long ago that is now. 
um, about 13 years ago, allows combustors which aren't convex hulls, um, definitely worth exploring. Dirichlet processes, um, more recently than the last, last 10 years, I suppose, um, probabilistic formulation for clustering that's non-parametric. I like these approaches a lot because they, they have some really con cool conceptual things. They allow things like previously unknown clusters to appear while you're running the algorithm. So you don't have to decide how many clusters you have, which is effectively what we do, isn't it? I mean, like, so people hear this, the Black Swan book, any people know about that? Nassim Taleb. I kind of think the book's based on a misunderstanding of data and confusion of robustness and uh, a non-parametric effect. But for economists, that's, uh, it's, it's probably sufficient. Um, he talks about a black swan event as being a sort of an event where something happens that you've never seen before. So um, I would say that that is two different, there's two different ways that happens in economics. economics. One is for a sort of an outlier to occur. So an outlier is something that's very highly noisy because of some, or, or a discontinuity to occur. Um, but they talk about that as being a black swan event, which I kind of feel, personally, I feel it's a little bit different. The black swan event is that you look, you see that there's only white swans, and then you go and you see that there's like a black swan. Well, to me, that feels like that's a new species and a new cluster. Um, and then you want to create a new cluster center for that. I don't think it's an outlier in that sense. But, you know, I guess it's, that's why he made a lot of money writing books, and I don't, because, you know, you can conflate these two ideas. Um, so you might want clustering algorithms that allow for new um, species to appear as you search around. You go to Australia, you find a lot of new animals. Um, okay, so, so that, that's it for um, clustering. So, so any, any questions on that? I'm going to talk about uh, continuous dimensionality reduction. Uh, next. Questions on that? Conceptually, I kind of think of clustering as being, maybe a lot of people wouldn't think this, as being like a dimensionality reduction. Well, a latent variable algorithm, I should say, not really dimensionality reduction necessarily, because uh, your latent variable is now what discrete cluster do you belong to. The sort of things you're going to look at today in class are different. They're sort of where on the spectrum are you? So I like the word spectrum because it actually indicates the way most things genuinely are. So what's, what's a clustering that you're all doing right as you speak? You can't help it. There's nothing you can do about it. I think the only way you could stop yourself clustering would be to close your eyes. <laughs> what, what, do your lies, what do your eyes perceive? <laughs> Colors. Colors. Yeah. So is the spectrum of light continuous or discrete? Continuous. continuous. So what the hell are colors? <laughs> <coughs> They're an arbitrary clustering of the spectrum of light. There's some sort of quantization, actually. So you, you have three sensors that are detecting red. They're detecting over a range of colors and responding over a range of colors. And when you see a particular color, you're firing those sensors in a sort of discrete allocation way. Now, they're responsive to overlapping colors, right? So when you, um, and you perceive them in a funny way. So you've got a continuum of color here. You've got red, green, and blue sensors. So a color comes in here, and if it's only in this, then the green doesn't respond, the blue doesn't respond, and you perceive red. Yeah? If it comes in here, what happens? This is one pure color. So like a single wavelength of light. What actually happens is you say, oh, it, it belongs to red and green. Of course it doesn't, it's between the two. But you perceive it as belonging to red and green because you fire red and green and you perceive yellow if you fire red and green. If you perceive red, green, and blue, so how can that happen that if you perceive red, green, and blue? Well, two colors come in at the same time and they cause both these things to fire. So what actually happens is you're seeing lots of multiple different lights coming in, but you're just conflating them in this way. Now, the odd thing is, when you're looking at this screen, it's just regenerating red, green, and blue, right? So it's not actually recreating the colors as you see them or as they really reflect off a plant or something like that. It's just, re it's just mapping onto your clustering sensors. So if an alien were to look at this, they would they'd be like, what the hell? It doesn't make any sense. Because it's, it's actually totally interfaced to the way you're choosing 
choosing. You're not choosing, really, are you? The way you've evolved to perceive color. One funny point about that is, what the hell is magenta? Why is there a color wheel? Why does blue merge into red when it clearly doesn't? They're at opposite ends of the spectrum. Any ideas? That's definitely how you, that's definitely one way you can perceive it, yeah. But actually, another way you can perceive it is, is starting to see something going into the ultraviolet light. Because actually, what happens, what happens that causes you to perceive like this? It's funny, isn't it? Because you get taught, my son's doing this at school at the moment, color wheels. Poor kid, you know. He's got, I said to him, well, actually, what happened? Well, it doesn't make any sense, does it, color wheel? Um, <laughs> um, so uh, what's going on? Something fun is going on. It's actually related to what we just said about k-means clustering. So uh, the way I've drawn it is a bit like k-means clustering. But it doesn't look like that. So what does it look like that you get this perception of uh, a circular color wheel? Something really bizarre is going on. So it turns out that your red filter is sensitive in the blue range. If you look at the sensitivity, the response of your filters, that there's a pop-up. I think it's that way around. It may be the blue set filter sensitive in red, but I think I checked this once, and I think it's the red filter is sensitive in the blue range. So you see a continuum because as you go through this color here, as you go into ultraviolet, your red filter starts firing, even though its main response is this. It has a bimodal response. Bizarre, eh? I don't know what the cons why that it might be useful perceptually. There may be some reason. I'm not an expert in vision. Um, okay, so um, I like to sort of motivate high dimensional data um, for continuous uh, spaces. So, so actually that's a clustering in a 1D space. So we can see clustering is useful in a one dimensional space. Now there's no point in, um, in reducing the dimension of a one dimensional space. It's already one dimensional. But this sort of thing we're doing where we're projecting things onto a lower dimensional space like political affiliation. We do it with intelligence. IQ is a measure of this sort of thing. We do it with like the big five personality scores. All these sort of things that come from social science are a projection of you. You're actually a complex. If someone says you're ENTP, or have you ever done these things where they categorize you? You say, no, I'm not. I'm a complex individual. I'm unique. You can't classify them that way. Well, actually, they're doing some sort of clustering, but they're also doing a dimensionality reduction before they do the clustering. So you're on some sort of spectrum of capabilities if you measure your IQ. And a lot of this was worked out sort of about 100 years ago. People, social scientists were very interested in looking at this data. Um, so one way I sort of motivate that is try and think about how you look at high dimensional data and sort of think about a six. A six is a very high dimensional data point. And one of the points about high dimensional data is if we try and, um, if we look at this space, so this space here is 64 rows and 57 columns. It's a very large space. It's 3,648 dimensions. It's binary. So how many possible different images are there that could exist in this space? So it's two to the power of 3648. That is a massive number. That is more than the number of particles in the known universe. That's more than like, it's an enormous number. So it's no surprise that if we sample from, from this space, we don't see the original six. I pre-did these samples, so I know it wasn't going to come out like that. Um, but there you go. There's three samples. None of them look anything. They don't even look like anything. I mean, the chances of actually even seeing something that looks reasonable are probably quite small. They just look like noise, right? So when I say sample here, I'm assuming we're sampling pixels independently for each position. So we take each pixel and we say, there's a probability of it being on or a probability of it being off. And then we sort of say, we're just going to sample independently at each location. And all you get is black and white noise, uh, salt and pepper noise, this is sometimes called, because it, I don't know. I was going to say it looks like salt and pepper, but it doesn't look like salt and pepper, does it? It looks like black and white stuff. Um, conceptually, it raises the idea of salt and pepper in your mind somehow. Um, 
so it's called salt and pepper noise sometimes this um and uh it looks like nothing it doesn't certainly doesn't look like the original six so i'm going to switch because i didn't get time to do this um this visualization here so here's an alternative simple model of a, a digit so this model is rotate a prototype so what i'm showing is taking the six and rotating it around okay and by doing that what we're doing is we're staying within the space of where things are reasonably six. It's dumb to just have a model of sixes that says any pixel can move independently without doing anything. That basically is covering the whole space uniformly in terms of what can go on here. Everything can happen and it's all equally likely. We want to focus on the things that look like sixes. So if we were given some data, I like this idea that we could just say rotate a six around like this. That's actually quite difficult to model because this is an image rotation. It's not a rotation of the type I did last week where we just rotate the data space because these pixels are going around in some sort of nasty nonlinear way. So actually what we can do is, um, is plot that. And what I'm doing is I'm showing you principal component analysis, which is a dimensionality reduction technique. So we'll talk about how that's done in a moment. But what I've done is I've taken these sixes, I've rotated them 360 times around, and I've then showing you the so-called first two principal components of the data. This is, principal component analysis is an excellent way of analyzing data in terms of exploratory data analysis. One of the first things you should do is plot, this is the first two principal components. You can plot more, you can look at the second and the third. You're just finding dimensions um, that turn out to be maximum variance directions. But in this case, the first two principal components turn out, and I've shown the image of the closest, like at every 10 degrees or something. I think it's 10, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 times 4. It can't be 10, 12, 24. I don't know. Maybe it's not 10. Um, so I'm showing you at every 10 degrees or so, every 15 degrees maybe, um, what this image looks like. But what I've done is I've found two dimensions. So instead of taking political opinions, I'm taking rotated sixes, and I'm projecting them into these two dimensions, and I'm showing you where those crosses are. Now, the first time I did this, I was a little bit surprised it came out as a circle. It definitely should join up, because 360-degree rotation is the same as zero rotation. Um, you also see these sort of interesting little features here, which are associated with, as you rotate in images, you have to sort of, you can only rotate exactly 90 degrees, like that's easy rotation to do. You can't rotate exactly one degree, all the pixels sort of don't move fully. And so you have to do some sort of interpolation on the image. And this, this weird effect here is right close to the 90 degrees, that interpolation is at its worst. So you see a sort of noise distortion. But, Broadly speaking, you're seeing a one-dimensional thread, which is a circle, but it's living in a very high-dimensional space. So you've sort of got a 3,648-dimensional space, and in, within that space, we take that original six that exists as a point in that space, and we rotate it. It's going on some tour and then coming back, like going around the globe, but the globe is somehow 3,648-dimensional. So it's really one-dimensional, this data now. Now, they're nonlinear dimensions, and we're not going to do nonlinear dimensionality reduction. But even with linear dimensionality reduction, this is a linear projection, we can see, we can perceive that shape and start saying, oh, something, some interesting structure in this data. Now, in practice, of course, um, that's not all we might say about digits. So digits in practice, they actually undergo sort of several um, distortions. So other distortions we might believe in, are they thinning? So the width of the digit can change. They could elongate, they could stretch. You can imagine a bunch of transformations that keep a six a six. Actually turning it upside down makes it a nine. So that one wasn't valid. So at some point that transformation stops being valid. It took us into another cluster. Um, but in general, this is my sort of thing. And it's a sort of uh, tautology really. It's not uh, proper definition, but I kind of feel that for high dimensional data with structure, you generally expect fewer distortions than dimensions. Like if it was generally the case that your high dimensional data was covering the whole space, then you would just have noise. You wouldn't actually have anything interesting, you, like that salt and pepper thing we saw earlier. So we expect the data to live on this low dimensional manifold. So we could take all those rotated sixes, and then we could move them to thin them. And then that would push them in another direction. That would create a two dimensional surface. And then we could move to elongate them. That would create a three dimensional hyperplane. 
in the high dimensional space. So what we're trying to do with dimensionality reduction is extract that. It's sometimes thought about as feature extraction, trying to take that information out. Now, that would be nonlinear in this case, but nonlinear is quite hard, so we start by looking at linear approaches to dimensionality reduction. So principal component analysis, who's seen this before? Some of you should definitely have seen it. So the way you're normally taught it is to look at the data, compute the data's empirical covariance matrix, which you've actually been doing on x without subtracting the mean in previous lab classes, and then look for directions of maximum variance. So actually, what it involves, and I'm not going to spend any time on this, is because what it involves is exactly the introduction I did to multivariate Gaussians last week. It involves saying, I've got data like this. Conceptually, I then try and find the direction of maximum variance, which involves fitting the covariance matrix, first of all, of the full covariance Gaussian, which is set it to that. And then the principal components are the principal axes of that covariance matrix. And a lot of the proofs, the way you'll normally get introduced PCA, will focus on, on doing this, finding the first direction of maximum variance, and then finding an orthogonal direction that is the next highest variance. So cause obviously, that's, there's only one orthogonal direction in two-dimensional space. But in higher dimensional space, there's many orthogonal dimensions. Now, that doesn't have to be to Gaussian data. So very often, you'll see people applying PCA to sort of any sort of data of this sort. It might be around like this. And then it might even have some sort of cluster of things here. And then you'll just get a mean here, and then you'll get some principal components like that. So it doesn't, even if the data is clusters, people will still do it. And then they'll even look and sort of say, oh, look, and then this end of the principal component, here's the cats, this is the dogs. So this component here is the cat to dogness, you know, or something like that. So sometimes it's weird. People sometimes refer to PCA as a clustering algorithm because you can get that effect, but it's not actually the intention to get that effect. So that's actually normally solved by this. I'm just overviewing this for you. I don't expect you to sort of learn this and reproduce this to the exam. This is just the way you would often be introduced PCA. And we're not going to do it that way here. So you define a Lagrangian. This is projecting down onto the direction of maximum variance. You're trying to maximize this term with a constraint on this direction being length 1. And that turns out to be an eigenvalue problem. So eigenvalue problems, I put a link in the... Um, lectures here, so please look them up, because we still need the eigenvalue problem to do the latent variable analysis. But the way you're going to start doing it in the lab is not to do that. What we're going to do is do it generatively. So all along, you've been looking at linear models, not quite of this form, because you've been looking at one-dimensional outputs. So you would be W transpose x. Here, the only difference is y is multidimensional, so W becomes a matrix. So instead of looking at one output from an input, so here the inputs are the latent variables, the output's going to be the data. So the data's high dimensional, Y, and because of that you get a matrix that's mapping from the low dimensional space to the high dimensional. Now this way of building it in this way is a generative, uh, called a generative process. So this is the noise model, epsilon, so we're going to take whatever's coming out from x, which is low dimensional, we're going to map it up to high dimensions, and then we're going to add noise. So the easy way to conceive of that is w just represents an affine transformation. I should travel with pieces of paper. What a disgustingly small piece of paper I have. w just represents a piece of paper. If, it's a, if x, the latent space, is two-dimensional, y, the output space, is three-dimensional, this matrix here is going to be um, Let's see, 3 by 2, right? Because it's uh, sort of a, or 2 by 3. S well, let's get it right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. 3 by 2. Um, it, this is going to be 3 by 2, obviously, isn't it? Because it's 3 by 2 times 2 by 1. It's give us a 3 by 1, yeah? Very good, you see. You've learned your stuff. It's harder when you're on stage. <laughs> um, OK, so the 3 by 2 matrix actually represents this piece of paper. In terms of the magnitude, it, it is a magnitude vector. But actually, if you look at the normal vectors, if you normalize the vectors, it just gives us the location of this piece of paper in space. So when we're trying to fit W, we're trying to find this piece of paper here. X lives on this surface here. And then W maps it into the three-dimensional space. And then we corrupt with a little bit of noise. That's the process. Now, in latent, uh, linear, uh, latent, 
in the latent variable approach to, um, in a linear latent variable model, what we need to do is do something else. No one gave us x now. So this would just be a standard multivariate regression if someone had given us x, the inputs, but they haven't. But what we're going to do is exactly what we did with w before, but now on x. We're going to say x is unknown, but we'll put a Gaussian prior on it. And that's the latent variable approach. Use a probability distribution to represent the unknown. Just as we did for the noise, we've, we will effectively be doing for the noise here. Just as we did for the missing Ws, we can't determine these things from the parameters, but we can put a prior over them and integrate them out. And that's all probabilistic latent variable modeling is based on that idea. All that changes is the prediction function. So if we had to do a nonlinear model, it makes things way, way harder to do this nonlinearly. You do a nonlinear, if you do the basis function stuff, this doesn't work because this is a nonlinear function of x. And when you try and push the Gaussian through the nonlinear function of x, it comes out in a horrible way. We cleverly forced the nonlinear function of x to be a linear function of w. That's why we could integrate out w in that case. We can't nonlinearize in that way so trivially for um, PCA. So this is the form of the likelihood, which is broadly speaking the same, as, the same as we saw before. But now we have this prior over x, which I've just taken to be zero mean and unit covariance Gaussian. Turns out it doesn't matter uh, what that form is, so it's best to choose it as unit covariance. Um, the computation of the marginal likelihood then proceeds in the following way. It's the same as we had before. I'll go through this again briefly in the lecture. Um, in the, sorry, the lab. Um, we've got these three probability distributions. We're defining y given x and w. We're defining a probability distribution over x and a probability distribution over epsilon. Sorry, it was y given x and w and epsilon. Now, because of the multivariate rules of probability, we know that w times x, the mean is zero, so the w times zero is zero. The covariance is w sigma w transpose, which is just w w transpose. Yeah? So that tells us the distribution of that. So that's actually degenerate, because this is a three by two. This is rank two. So somehow this is a Gaussian living. It's a slice Gaussian. It's a Gaussian that still lives when we project it into high dimensional space, it lives exactly on the high dimensional space. It doesn't believe in anything that comes off that space. That's the degeneracy of the Gaussian. It's not a, tr it's not a true distribution over this space. But when we add the noise on, we lose that degeneracy. So now we're sort of going broop, away and saying, yep, there's some noise in that space, which just uh, softens stuff out. Just like we saw on that line going around where we had some movement away from the pure line. So that noise gives us a proper probability density, and it's, the form, it's this form of a Gaussian. So it's a very specific Gaussian, and this is known as probabilistic PCA. Um, this is actually very much the way that um, Hotelling, who introduced PCA, introduced it. Hotelling was working at a time when people were interested in factor analysis. They were interested in all these things we talked about, like how can you measure people and categorize them, you know. It's a funny time, actually, because they did a lot of this. And of course, a lot of it went into uh, eugenics and some pretty nasty stuff about how you categorize and measure people. So, but a lot of it was with very nice reasons as well, just trying to understand people better socially. And Hotelling was a mathematician who was looking at, that's called factor analysis. This is really factor analysis. Um, in factor analysis, he said, well, that's not very mathematical to call it factor analysis because th there's, there's a mathematical meaning of the word factor. And, and that's different from uh, what people mean in psychology when they say factor. I think that was a massive mistake because actually this is a factorization. It's a factorization of the covariance matrix. So it's a mathematical factorization and it's conceptually a psychological factorization. So although I use the term PCA, he sort of said, let's rename it. He came up with this al model and this algorithm. He didn't, in his model, he set epsilon to zero, right? So he had a degenerate covariance which is why PCA is not normally considered probabilistic. But he basically describes this model, and then he came up with the eigenvalue algorithm for it, which is how uh, it's normally solved. Always separate model and algorithm. Um, and then he described uh, up to here. Now, what people did, a colleague of mine, a friend of mine, Mike Tipping, did is he added this bit. And another friend, Sam Roice, also did the same thing. And they modified the model in this way to make it a proper probability model. Um, 
it's a really, really important model. And it's like almost whatever domain you're in, if you're doing multivariate analysis, is the first thing you should do. And like it's got so many different names. It's known as latent semantic indexing. It's known as Carl and Love transform. Because so many different ideas for how you should model actually come down to this eigenvalues of the covariance matrix. This is a different idea, actually, to the maximum variance idea that you normally see it motivated by. So it's a really critical model. And you'll be playing with a few different data sets. But because latent variable models take you in all sorts of different directions, now you know this, you could easily try, if what, if you do, yeah, I mean, you know. When you know this, um, you can easily try independent component analysis, factor analysis, nonlinear. You can, you can understand all these things within this framework, which is why I teach it in this way. OK, so time for a quick question, um, because uh, they're already outside the next class. Um, or there'll be time for questions in the lab. The lab will really take you through the latent variable approach slowly. So what in the lecture I've tried to do is give you the context of where this latent variable approach sits, right? There are other ways of doing unsupervised learning. We could do two courses on unsupervised learning and still not get through it all. Um, we could do an entire course on clustering. We could do oh, we could do all sorts. We're not going to. We just did one lecture. But the thing I want you to learn in depth is about latent variable models, because it'll take you in different directions. And it relates closely to material you've already seen. OK? Right. So see you at um, 11 o'clock.